Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to go talk about Moses for a little bit today. Uh, last week we started a series talking about questions are better than answers. Questions are better than answers. I fully believe that questions are better than answers. I get really tired of people who got it all figured out. It's nice every once in a while to have somebody humble enough to say they don't know. Because the truth is, we there's a lot that we just don't know. And so last week we talked about the first question God ever asked in the scriptures. God asks, where are you? Adam is hiding. He sinned and he's hiding away from God. And God comes and he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And I asked you to ask that question. I hope you did this week. I hope you answered that question for yourself. Where are you? Where are you spiritually? Where are you emotionally? Where are you mentally? I know we know where we're at physically, usually, kind of. I don't know. I've had a couple of dreams this past week. You ever have one of those dreams where you wake up and you had no idea how you got where you got? And even when you're in your bed, you're like, wow, that dream was really real. I have no idea how I got here. <laughs> I want you to just think about it. Where, where are you with the Lord today? Now, as we continue moving into another question today, what I really want us to do is I want us to begin to be okay with that there is some mystery to what God does and wants. There is some mystery for us. See, Paul said it this way. He says, now we see as in a mirror dimly, but one day we'll see in clarity. One day we'll see clearly what God is doing. But for now, I want you to know, you don't know what God is doing. You have no idea why that person is sick. You have no idea why difficulties are coming your way. You have no idea what the bigger plan is. But what you can do is rest in the knowledge that he's working all things for our good. Now, many of us, I, I, I just want to take one second and talk about... Um, the blessing of Askeville Assembly. I, I'm, I'm already sweating and I ain't even started preaching yet, but I want to tell you why. I, 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 I was quarantined this week because my boys, uh, one of the boys tested. We all tested negative. That's why we're here today. We're all free and clear. But I, it, it slipped my mind until last night about 630 that baptism Sunday was today. And there's something that has to happen for that to happen. And so Mr. David, on his day off, came out here and filled the tank up. So we can baptize this morning. And and he warned it. <laughs> and if any of y'all have some essential oils, I'm telling you, you should just bask in it this afternoon sometime. Um, I'm, not saying, I'm not fevered. Let's not check it, though. I'm just telling you. Uh, it was very, very comfortable and soothing. Um, but I, I, I only mentioned that to say... I don't know if I'd take enough time to properly thank our staff here at church. We have an amazing staff. David and Miss Jernigan and uh, Jennifer, y'all, and Amanda and Randy, y'all blow me away. I am so grateful for the work that y'all do on regular basis. Pastor Kevin and Pastor Stephanie are rocking it out. They're, they're knocking it out of the park, church. We are blessed and we are positioned to become a greater blessing for this community. Every Listen, somebody the other day was asking me about our teachers. And I told them, teachers here at BAC. And I told them, I said, I don't know a single teacher that's teaching here that I would be happy to see go. I don't know. We are in a place right now at BACA that I think every single person we have is a quality person that's only going to make this place better. We, we are fully staffed at Royal Rangers and Impact. That doesn't mean we don't need more. All right? If you would like to help in the children's ministry and boys' ministry, please sign up. But we, I'm telling you, every one of those people that are, are serving in those areas, we are so blessed. We are thrilled. We are a blessed people. Blessed with talent. Blessed with leadership. Blessed with the heart to serve. These worship teams, I encourage you, please, during the week, give me a text message. Let me know one other church that's got the talent that we do every single week leading us in worship. Let, let me know. Let, let me know. I'd like to know. I'd like to see where they're at. 
<laughs> we are so blessed. We are so thoroughly blessed at this church. And to whom much is given, much is required. What is in our hand to do? What are we going to accomplish with what God has blessed us with? May we not squander what God has given us. Today I want to ask you a different question. Something the Lord has been really stirring on my heart this week. I didn't get to preach on Wednesday. I didn't get to preach at chapel on Wednesday. So I just got to tell you, I got a full tank and I'm about to just, just, here we go. All right. If you, if you were to come to me for some advice or some counseling, I would sit down and listen to you for about 10 minutes. And then I would talk to you mostly about how you are worried and, and frustrated about stuff that's got nothing to do with you. Uh, most of us carry around stresses about what other people think about us. And guess what? You can't affect what other people think about you. A lot of us walk around heavy, burdened, heavy laden about what's taking place in Afghanistan or Washington, D.C. or across the nation, all these people. And guess what? Not a single day, not a single moment of your worry will affect any of that. Some of y'all wake up every morning chomping at the bit to find out whether it's going to rain or not. Because that means you either can't go to work or can't go fishing. And I know it matters a lot, but do you know not an ounce of your worry will change it? You might as well just go fishing. Because <laughs> not only will your worry matter one way or the other, but most of the time, I mean, some of the time he even gets it wrong. What if you wasted a whole day watching TV when you could have been on a river? I mean, you listen to this dude, right? How many of us spend all of our time worried about stuff that's on the periphery, that's beyond us? Beyond us to affect whatsoever. We spend most of our time freaked out about that. We are, we're worried about how, how, when, they, when they're going to come attack the church. When they're going to come and try to take our faith and take our building and take our, our ability to, to free, worship freely. We're all worried about all that stuff on the periphery. But you can't affect any of that. And that's probably why you're worried about it. Because if it was in your control, you could fix it, right? When in fact, it should be the opposite. You should only worry about the things that you can do something about. Okay, so that's, that's beyond you. Beyond. That, that's way past you. Here, here's, here's another realm that we often worry about. We often worry about relationships. Can I just tell you, I don't care how good you are, you can only affect your relationships 50%. Now, you should bring 100% into your marriage, but you can only affect 50%. I don't care if that person has chosen not to love you, you cannot make that person love you. The best thing you can do is pray. Yep. Only God can turn the heart of someone like that. But in relationships, you cannot assume more than 51%. I mean, more than 50%. If you go to thinking that it's your 51% responsible, you're wrong. Listen, parents, even with your own kids, you cannot make them mind. You can incentivize them to mind. Right? Right? Let them know that a spanking is coming. They may choose to mind. But how many of y'all know some kids that won't even then? Come on, right? Right? You can take away their toys or take away their video games. And for some kids, that matters. Some of them, with just a stern look, fixes it. For some of them, you can beat, kick, take everything, go in the yard, take out you know, not feed them for days, and they're still going to be just as strong. Minded. Come on, can I get an amen somewhere? Come on. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you think you're in control of your kid, but you're not. In fact, this is what's most embarrassing most of the time for parents. When parents cannot control their kid, they get highly embarrassed a lot of time. Not every parent. But you shouldn't feel that way because you need to recognize that God put a free will in that child just like he did you. And I promise you, there have been somebody in your life that they wish you would mind better. Maybe not your mom and daddy. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it was a highway patrolman. But somebody wishes that you would have... So, so this is what I would say. If we were in a counseling situation, I could listen to you for about 10 minutes of you whining. And then I would say, I know you're upset that they don't care about you, but... There's nothing you can do about that. You can't make them think 
a certain way. You can't make them live a certain way. You can't make them do a certain thing. So you've got to make a decision. Are you going to be one who continues to invest in a relationship that you can't change that other person? Because if you're in a relationship with somebody, your point should not be to change them. Your point should be to love them. That's something all, probably all wives needed to know before they got married. But that's, um, sorry. Anyway, we should probably, if you see a young girl, just go ahead and let her know this. You know, that, all right, anyway. Let's go down a little bit further. Okay, so, so here goes a round that we often don't ever take a whole lot of responsibility for. Is the area of our stewardship, our personal possessions. Look, nobody has more influence on your time, talent, and treasure than you do. But you're always whining that you don't have enough time. Let me, let me help you with something. You get the same 24 hours that Donald Trump does. The same 24 hours that Joe Biden does. The same 24 hours that, let's see, anybody else? Any football player or any, anybody who's ever been successful. Do you know they got the same 24 hours you did? Wow. So when you complain you don't have enough time, guess what they probably think? You, anyway, all right, let's not talk about it. We all have 24 hours to live. If you don't have enough time to get everything done, you're doing too much. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. Your talent. Do you know that God has designed you with specific skills and abilities? Now, you can spend all your days whining about how you can't sing like Webb, or you don't look like Webb, or you don't preach like Webb, all right? Anyway, anyway. Uh, you can whine all your days about pointing out to somebody else, I, I don't look like them. I don't, I don't have what they have. I wish I had their boat. I wish I had their house. I wish I had their kids. Look, you can spend all your days looking at other people wishing you had what somebody else had. But the truth is you've been given a certain amount of talent. And if you don't take responsibility for what you have, you're not going to enjoy it very much. Some of us in the room just need to get okay with the skills that we have and be okay with the fact that there's some skills we don't have. All right. And that's where I will turn you to. I start telling you, what can you do? Stop focusing on the economy and talk about your job. My job don't pay me enough. Did you choose your job? Are we in a communist nation where you had to take the job they gave to you? Are, are, you, a, are you a worker bee? Did they just decide where you were going or did you choose that job? Well, I can't make enough money to pay all my bills. Okay. Well, then either you need to get rid of some of your bills, which we can't do that, right? Wow. Go without cable? Why even live? Can't get rid of, can't get rid of that. We've got to have all of our dreams. We've got to have the SUV. So, obviously, the problem is the job. All right. Moving on. Third one. It gets nicer later, guys. I just want you to hear these first things up front. All right. See, see, this is why I'm probably not a good counselor. You probably wouldn't enjoy it. it I'm telling you, Amanda would listen and she'd love you and she would just be so understanding, okay? The third area is your treasure, your, mon uh, your money. And I just kind of hit on that. Your time, your talent, your treasure, your time, your skills, and your, and your money. We're only given a certain finite amount of, of finances in our life. Are you handling them correctly? We can spend all of our days fussing about how I haven't made enough. Or we can choose to be wiser about what we make. Okay, but that's, that's, that's the third area. Stewardship. What are you stewarding in your life? Everybody in this room, you have made decisions about how to steward what God has given you. The giftings that God has given you. The time that He's given you. The, the money that He's given you. But even that, here's where I would really want you to go all the way back to. Is health. Not just physical health, which I think that's good. We should all be mindful of what we're putting in our bodies. Physical health is important. But emotional health is too. What are you allowing to destroy your emotional health? Do you know that the only person, entity, thing, idea that has control over your emotional health is you? If you ever say to yourself, I'm just not happy, can I just tell you there's no decision on earth you can make? There's no person you can separate yourself from. There's no circumstance you can leave. There's not a job you can quit. If you decide for yourself that you're not happy, you're just not going to be happy. 
And do you know that nobody else can make you happy? You can spend all your days talking about how your mama and your daddy and that first boyfriend and I wrecked my favorite car and when my dog died and when I, I never got the horsey I wanted and I didn't get the, I, I don't have, the, my parents never gave me the video game console that I should have had. I was always sat the bench on basketball. I've never had a good self-image because of that. I've always been chubby and that's all I'll ever be. When we spend all of our time rehearsing all the things we don't have and how we're unhappy because of other circumstances, can I just tell you, you're just rehearsing your own unhappiness. The only person who can make you happy, can, can, can we just let's say it together? The only person who can make you happy is you. I'm, I'm going to flip it and I want you to say it to yourself. And just, let this be a, a therapeutic moment for you. The only person who can make me happy is me. Come on, say it for yourself. Go ahead. It'll be healing to you. Go ahead. The only person who can make me happy is me. That was freeing right there, wasn't it? One last time. The only person who can make me happy is me. So this is how I'm going to start responding. When somebody comes to me and tells me that they're unhappy with me, I'm just going to be like the only person who can make you happy. Is you. All right. So that's emotionally unhealthy. How about mentally unhealthy? How many of us have things in our mind that we are constantly rehearsing over and over again? We can't get it out. Listen. Paul is specific. He says we cast down every imagination. Every thought that flies through our mind. You can't stop a thought from flying through your mind, but you can stop yourself from meditating on it. If you begin to meditate on things that ought not be thought about, then you need to start quoting scripture. You say, Pastor, I don't know any scriptures to quote. Then learn some. Like that's, that's why we have scripture. It's so that we can meditate on the word of God and allow those thoughts to be the ones that we meditate on. If you're having issues with your mental life, I encourage you. Learn Psalm 23. The next time that, that bird flies through the cave, don't let it make a nest. You begin to quote Psalm 23 and remind yourself. Quote uh, the Lord's Prayer and remind yourself. Quote John 3.16. If you can't think of anything else, quote John, uh, Jesus wept. Just say it over and over again. The only scripture you got is Jesus wept. Or just say it in the beginning. Just say it over and over again until it goes away. All right? What, what's my point? Your personal health, there's nobody else that has more to do with it than you do. And yet, most of the time when we're stressed out, we want to focus on everything else. No one has more control over your health than you do. But you're not stressed out about your health, are you? You're stressed out about your husband's health, your mama's health. You're stressed out of the health of the economy. You can't fix that. This is... This, this was really helpful for me when I finally realized that when I get stressed out about social media and, and what's take, taking place in the big world, usually it's that I'm trying to neglect something in myself. Well, Moses, the story of Exodus chapter 4, we're going to get to 4 in just a moment, but Exodus, we open up and Moses is writing the story of how the deliverance of Israel took place. And as we get to the first chapter in Exodus, he writes... The people of Israel were in bondage because there was a king that no longer remembered what Joseph did. He's penning these words. And he says, the Pharaoh come up with a good idea. As the Hebrews continued to grow, that they had to get rid of all the men, all the boys, because they didn't want the Hebrews to rise up and overtake the Egyptians. So did, did you hear it? He said, the, the Pharaoh said, the women don't matter. We've got to be afraid of the men. The boys will uprise. So Moses puts that in there. They started throwing the boys in the, in, the, in the Nile, started killing all these babies, which mirrors what took place during Jesus' day. But as Moses is writing it, then he talks about the heroes of the story. He said, the Egyptian midwives could not put to death the babies. So they told Pharaoh, these Hebrew women are just not like us Egyptians. When they go into labor, man, they just get that baby out. We don't even know. I mean, we, the baby's born before we can get there and kill it. So I don't know what to tell you, Pharaoh. So then Pharaoh said, okay, once they're born, I want you to take every one of those babies. I want you to throw them in the Nile and drown them. The midwives still couldn't do that. Moses' mother decides to put, she put together a little basket and put Moses in the edge of the river. 
told his sister, Miriam, to watch it, make sure he doesn't float away. And then it's the daughter of Pharaoh who finds Moses. As Moses is pinning this, he says, Pharaoh thought that men were the, were the things that he had to be worried about, but it was the women who saved me. Mothers, I know you're probably wondering sometimes why don't your husband lead our family better or why didn't he pray more or whatever. I'm sure you got some angst about some stuff. But you still have got a place in your home. And you can save your children. You just, you got to be willing to stand up against what society is expecting from you. Everybody's trying to tell you, everybody's trying to tell somebody else that you're not good enough. And those are the voices in your head. I'm telling you right now, you've got everything you need to obey God and His fullness. To be righteous in what God is calling you to do. So Moses' heroes are women. He grows up in the palace. He's Pharaoh's daughter, but his mama gets to know him all the way through the weaning years, probably about seven or eight years old, that uh, he gets to see his real mother, his Hebrew mother. Later on in life, he's been a, uh, a prince for years, and he's learned how to be a leader. He's learned how to, to, to guide people. And at 40 years old, he remembers who he was as a Hebrew and he wants to deliver his people. And he sees an unrighteous thing take place. A man is attacking another Hebrew. And he gets mad. And he goes and kills the Egyptian. And thinking that the Hebrews were going to be grateful. They responded with. Oh. You kill that guy and think we're not going to rat on you. When are you going to kill one of us? Moses panics. Moses in his heart wanted to deliver Israel. But he didn't, understand, he didn't realize that some of the people he came to deliver. Would not understand what he came to do. He runs into the wilderness. He runs away. For 40 years. He was 40 years old when this took place. For 40 years. He's a shepherd. Can you imagine going from the palace to the wilderness? For 40 years he's a shepherd. He's out there among the sheep. I want to tell you today. I don't know what age you're at today. But Moses didn't start his ministry until he was 80. It's not too late for you. If God has called you to do something, He can bring it to pass. Do not fret. Do not think your time is over. God can do more with your what's left than you could have ever done with all that you got. God can do more with your what's left than you could ever do with all that He gave you. Your time, your talent, your treasure is very minute, but within the hands of God, there's nothing He cannot accomplish. And so he's out there shepherding one day and he sees a bush that's on fire. He walks over to it. It's interesting to him. And from the bush, God says, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to lead my people out so that they may worship me and populate the land I promised to Abraham. And Moses don't like it. He's not okay with it. Moses internally bothered. Tells him, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? See, in a counseling situation, I would tell you that you need to focus on what is ever in your hand to do. But as I read this scripture, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, even what you think is in your hand, you need to let go of. Even what you think, the only person who can affect it is you, which is your happiness, your emotional health, your mental health. Yes, even that you have to let go of and give it to God. He says, what's that in your hand? He said, it's a staff. And he said... Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. So what I want you to understand is that even the things that you think are in your hand, if you'll put them before the Lord, they'll come to life. They'll become living. Now it became a serpent, y'all. It would have been better if it became like a deer, right? I mean... Or sheep. I mean, that's what it would make more sense to me, you know. Just, but a snake, I don't want to be near a snake. Listen, if you'll let go, 
of what is in your hand, God can bring it to life and not only make it living, but he can bring it to life that everyone else will fear the God that is yours. I freak out about snakes, y'all. I don't like them. I had a thought one time that if I ever found a snake in our house in danger, I'd just burn the house down and move somewhere else. They, they, they bother me. Why in the world would God choose a snake to make his staff turn into? Because when anybody saw a snake, they would notice. He throws that staff down and becomes a snake. It becomes a living thing. Believers, I don't know what's in your hand today. I don't know what you've been anxious about. But I can tell you this right now. What you think is dead, what you think you have full control over, if you'll let go of it, God can bring it to life. Rick Warren says it this way. He said, that staff for Moses, the staff represented uh, influence. It, it, it represented his identity. It, 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 it was his income. Everything that Moses understood of that part of his life was in that staff. And when he let go of it, it actually came to life. For years, he'd been in control of it. But it was his identity as a shepherd. Everybody knew Moses at that point as a shepherd, not as a prince. Not as a, as a preacher. They knew him as a shepherd. His income. everything, The way he took care of his family was through that staff as sheep herding. And he let go of it. It was also his influence. It was the way he moved sheep. And God said, if you'll let go of what you have, I'll bring it to life. I'll bring it to life. Now, if you continue reading, Moses continues to be... A little bit scared, a little insecure. So God says, why don't you get Aaron to help you? He'll speak for you sometimes. And for the rest of the rest of the story, through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we see a staff becomes a very powerful tool for the rest of the time in the story. Now, sometimes it's called Moses' staff. Sometimes it's called Aaron's staff. But the truth is, one or another, this all began with this moment when he was willing to let go of what was his and let God turn it, make it go alive. And as he let it go, we now see that when he goes before the Pharaoh, he drops that staff again and it becomes a snake. And Pharaoh looks at the other guys and he says, make yours become a snake. So they throw their staff down and their staff becomes snakes, which is very interesting to me. I'd, I'd love to really know what took place there. But the cool thing was Moses' snake was hungry. Moses' snake ate the other staffs, ate the other snakes. I wonder when he picked it back up, did the staff get bigger? Because now it was three. Anyway, so. Things I wonder. I just can't wait to find out all this stuff. I can't wait to get that book and know it all. When, when he drops that staff, it comes. When he takes it to the Red I mean, when he takes it to the Nile, the Nile turns to blood. When he lifts it, many of the plagues came to pass because they would lift that staff. When he goes to the Red Sea, he'd lift that staff, and the Red Sea was split in half so they could walk across on dry ground. And then when he dropped it, the, the waters rushed back, and the, the whole army was drowned behind him. There was a time where he struck a rock, and water poured out when all the people were so thirsty. He struck a rock, and the waters came. That rock, that, that staff was the one he had held over his head when they were fighting the Amalekites. And while as long as he held it up in the air, they were winning the battle. In fact, they eventually won the battle because Aaron and Hur picked up his arms so that he could keep that staff in the air. This staff became, we don't use this word jerk, but magical, right? Like, it did some incredible miracles. Some amazing things took place because he was willing to let go of the thing. That meant most to him. I want you to think about this for just a second. The day that he let go of that was the last day he ever used it as a shepherd's staff. Wow. He never used that staff as a shepherd's staff again. He never led sheep another day in his life. For the next 40 years, he led people. When God, when Jesus finds John, James, and Peter... And Andrew, he says to them, you've been fishermen, but now I want you to be fishers of men. Jesus dies, he resurrects, he introduces himself back to the disciples. They all know he's alive, but where does he catch them at the end? In chapter 20 of John, he catches them fishing again. Jesus, Peter jumps out the boat, swims over. Hey, I just want to make sure we're cool. You know, I know I said, you know, I didn't, whatever. And I can just hear Jesus going... What are you doing out here? Do you believe me or not? 
Do you think I'm the Christ or not? Why are you fishing? I called you to be a fisher of men. I know this is hitting y'all like it's hitting me, but I don't know what it is that's in your hand that you think is your identity. It's the most important thing in your life, but I'm telling you, if you will place it in the hand of God, He can bring it to life, and you will no longer be someone who's just making meals, or just welding equipment, or just cutting down trees, but you will be somebody who begins to fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ right where you are, wherever you are, every single day. He can bring your greatest skill to life and make it be something that brings people to Him. How cool would that be? Nurses, how cool would it be if you never had to tell somebody about Jesus, but they sensed the presence of God when you walked in the room? Teachers who go into public school, when those kids, they have problems in their home, they know where to come because there's a spirit within inside of you that if you'll give it to God, He'll give you the opportunity of a lifetime to bless us. You're trying to spend all your days trying to figure out how you can become a missionary. And I'm telling you today that God wants to use what's in your hands so that you can be a missionary in this community right now. Amen. What is in your hand? What can you do right now? Stop dreaming about Morocco. Stop dreaming about China. Stop looking for other places and begin to think about what God can do. What's in your hand right now that if you put it in the hands of God, it can bring it to life. It bring people to new life because of it. Who's under your house right now that needs to know about Jesus Christ? You're praying for open doors in other places of the earth, but there's people under your own roof that need Jesus. Moses changed the story. He was changed when he gave God his influence, when he gave God his income, and when he gave God his identity. Look at the amazing things he was able to accomplish. The miracles that took place by the hand, by that staff that was at one point his entire identity. At the end, at the end of the story, it buds into almonds. It, it budded. It had been a stick for over 40 some years. Did it buds? To prove once again, it had life. Now listen, he was 80. It had been a stick for a very long time, and it buds. Listen, older saint in this room, you can still bud. There are skills. There are blessings. There are seeds planted in you. That you have prayed to God, He would bring to pass into full budding. And He may be waiting. When you feel like it's over and done with, He may be waiting. When every hair has turned to white, He may be waiting. So that forever it will be stated. I remember. I remember when they budded. When they should have put their cleats up, they went back to work one more day. God did something amazing. Don't coast your way into eternity. Serve your way all the way to the last minute. Amen. Amen. So what's in your hand? What are you believing God for today? What's in your hand? Maybe you need to let go of your marriage. I don't, I don't mean like leave it. But maybe you need to stop trying to strangle it to death and make it work. Maybe you need to start giving it to the Lord. I hate to preach Amanda's message. One day she'll preach this to you. But this is what she found out early on in our marriage. It don't do no good to talk to me. It does real good to talk to the Holy Spirit. She couldn't get me to do anything. Can you believe that? She said often about the second year of marriage, she would pray about it and she would see me change. I'd come to her and I'd be like, what do you think about doing this? And she'd be like, 
okay? I've been praying that for like two weeks, but sure. You know, like the things that she wanted me to change, she was just telling God, to, to tell on me with God. We got a lot healthier after that. <laughs> Maybe some of you need to let go of your children. I don't mean stop teaching them, stop praying for them. I mean, give them to God. Trust that He's going to be the one who brings them either back, brings them to fulfillment, brings them into success, brings them to survival. But you can't be somebody's Savior. And as long as you're willing to stand in the gap as the Savior, you're not giving room for Jesus to be. That won't even in my notes, show. Maybe it's your job. Some of you need to let go of the job you got because God is trying to take you somewhere else but you're scared to death. I know this job. I'd rather have the jerk I know than the jerk I don't know. I'm not saying this everybody's circumstance. I'm just telling you, maybe today you need to let go of what God has blessed you with and trust that He's going to take you where you're supposed to go. Maybe it's your giftings. Maybe it's your health. I mean, I did, I did good for a short season in my health. I'm, I'm going to get back to it. But I remember the best time I ever did was when I started just saying to God, God, give me the grace to eat what is right. God, give me the grace to eat what is right. I cannot cripple my, my flesh, y'all. I can't do it. I want pizza. And I cannot make, I cannot shame this flesh enough to not want pizza. But God has graced me some portions of my life to eat what is right. Maybe it's not a physical thing. Maybe it's emotionally. You need to stop binge, binge watching things that are bothering you. Maybe it's a mental thing. You need to start studying. You need to keep your mind on things above. And ask God for the grace. Maybe it's your future. You are panicked about your future. Give it to God. He can bring it to life. Maybe some of you are hanging on to offenses. You need to give it to God. That which you feel like is dead, He can bring to life. That which you think you have control over, He can part seas with it. He can bring water from a rock. He can win battles with it if you'll just let Him have it. Get it out of your hand. He can slay your enemies if you'll just give it to them. He can change the, the, the atmosphere of a river. He can let it bud in your old age if you'll just give it to God. What's in your hand? Put your most precious possession today, like his mother did. Put your most precious possession in the Nile and trust God to keep it safe. Put your identity on the ground and watch it come to life. Lay down your plans. He can do more with your what's left than you can do with everything. Believe that. Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.